All right. Well, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. It is wonderful to be here. And I hope the, those in the room don't mind that I'm going to present while sitting just so that everybody online can also see me and um, have access to the PowerPoint and everything. But um, my voice tends to project. Let me know if you have any issue hearing. Um, I uh, am so grateful to CTRL for agreeing to let me come and share this work, um, this book with you all today. Um, this has definitely been a labor of love and it is wonderful to see so many people in the audience that have contributed to giving me space to write, to think about college teaching, to be on a campus where college teaching is valued so much more than so many other research universities. And um, so I really feel like you all are a part of this journey with me. Um, and uh, and so, uh, so today I'm going to be sharing with you a little bit about uh, my book, Great College Teaching, where it happens and how to foster it everywhere. And um, so just a little background on the book and uh, why, uh, why I wrote this book. We actually know a great deal about what great college teaching is. Our teaching, our, our understandings are rapidly evolving. And I think, um, so, so to, to name that there is a strong research base is important because that's not always acknowledged. Uh, but also to note that we are continually learning about what great college teaching is. But a place where the literature base is largely absent is more about the institutional context that foster great college teaching because we all know that knowing about something is not the same as doing it, enacting it, ensure that ensuring that there's a culture around it and a culture for it. And so, um, so, so this, this book um, is, is really about making that connection, uh, make, making that bridge between what we know about college teaching and what we know about the contexts for that teaching. And um, I was fortunate to have Harvard Education Press uh, to, um, uh, to uh, publish this book. And it is just released. Literally, you know, a couple weeks ago, got my copy. So, um, so, yeah, so it's wonderful to be able to share with you all early on in its publication. All right. So, so one of the things that we know is that We've been trying to improve college teaching for more than half a century, right? There's, there's really a great deal of research, even 50 years ago, that documents how many universities are trying to improve college teaching. But yet, college teaching has not moved the mark in the way that we would hope it would during this time period, given the advances in what we know about college teaching. And so let's center it on the context of the faculty doing this work and this labor. Um, because challenges to teaching improvement in higher education really are situated in specific institutional, disciplinary, course, and faculty context, context. And so I just want you to imagine, sorry, I need to move this slide. There we go. Um, uh, let's imagine these three contexts. Let's imagine an adjunct faculty member perhaps a black male teaching a large size first year science, technology, engineering, and math STEM, STEM course um, in a regional comprehensive university. What is teaching improvement like for that particular faculty member? Let's think about a tenured faculty member, perhaps a white male who has been at a small liberal arts institution wearing multiple hats and teaching history in small upper level seminar courses for 25 years. What would teaching improvement look like in that context? And then let's also consider the early tenure track faculty member, perhaps a Latina in psychology, whose first faculty role was at a highly ranked private university and, it, they, and she's teaching Psych 101 with three teaching assistants. What would support and motivate teaching improvement for her and for all of these faculty in their very divergent backgrounds and contexts? And let's think about this a little more closely. Okay. Oh, the, um, it doesn't appear, actually, we're gonna go back just for a second. Well, we'll do the slide now. 
So, sorry, these were supposed to come up one at a time and I was going to ask you all. <laughs> so, so here are some contexts that are foundational to all of them. All right. Um, so first, none of them across all three can document their excellence as teachers, right? In a way that they could share that on a CV, in a way that they could, if they were going on a job interview, right, that they could take and demonstrate that excellence. We have teaching evaluations, but we know that those are highly biased instruments. And actually here at AU, we've been in a place where we fully recognize that. Um, this is another really important one that we don't acknowledge enough, which is that most faculty have intrinsic motivation to teach well. So there's a lot of conversation in higher education about, well, why don't faculty care more about teaching? Sort of blaming the faculty members for not caring enough. This is not the problem with teaching improvement. So another thing to acknowledge is that for all three of these faculty, teaching is a significant, or in some cases, all of their faculty role, right, for adjunct faculty, although many adjunct faculty actually participate more and more in service, so that is not true across all faculty, but for not all fa adjunct faculty, but for some faculty, teaching might be the only part, but for all of them, it is a significant part. And the reason I name that is that teaching is really foundational to who faculty are. And part of the way that we separate an understanding of what the professoriate is compared to other kinds of staff roles in higher education and also um, other kinds of employment across different industries. So teaching is foundational. And unfortunately, they also exist in a system of higher education that largely does not reward great teaching. And we're gonna come back to this over and over again, because as we talk about great college teaching, we know that if we have to go against the grain and go against reward structures and go against what's valued in our careers in order to do great college teaching, even those faculty that care deeply about doing great college teaching and care deeply about their students will have a hard time truly making whole, wholesale change to new kinds of approaches, innovative ideas, and especially in a context where the norm has not been equity-based teaching, this really has, um, this really has risks for not being able to create systemic improvement in equity-based teaching. All right, so I'm not gonna go to the next slide just in case the, the bullets don't come up one at a time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so these are the shared, some of the shared contexts, but actually I might ask you all, are there other shared contexts across these three faculty that you feel like we should lift up as important for teaching improvement before we go to what's different? And feel and um for the online folks, I can I can see you all too. So feel free to raise hands online, and I and we can have you share as well. Okay, I can see the board. Okay, great. Thanks. It doesn't apply to me, but I know it applies to colleagues in other parts of the campus where they are they are teaching a, a first or second year course and they are required to hit certain deliverables because their course is a prerequisite for someone else's course. And so it makes it difficult for them to improve the curriculum or their pedagogy because they feel like they're in a very tight um, bounded space. They can't vary too much or it's going to mess up other things in their department. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. DeCure. I'm, I, I'm glad you raised that the curriculum and the way that the curriculum is rolled out um, can either enhance faculty sense of agency in their teaching and their pedagogy, or could also be limiting. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, so in, in certain contexts that might be shared. Mm -hmm. I think this is related to the point you were making about like, um, not necessarily being able to demonstrate excellent teaching, but they may or may not be in a position to observe how their students do after their class or like, like to, to be able to kind of like see the long-term success or celebrate that. That's right. That's, that, that's absolutely true. I think, I think that, that is something that all faculty feel as they, as they try to lift up their teaching. 
And I just wanted to make sure I didn't miss anything in the chat here. Actually, Lindsay, will you let me know if there's a question Absolutely. in the chat? Yeah. Okay, great. Wonderful. Um, and did I see, was there another? Well, I was just going to say that shared context is they're all teaching students. And there are, at least currently, and always have been a lot of challenges um, that students bring to the classroom that faculty can't necessarily control but need to be responsive to in order to do great teaching. So the shared, like sharing the student challenges. Yeah, well, challenges and also the 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 um, sharing the the um, exuberance around supporting students, right? Like that, I feel like that that is you know just like the the shared uh, intrinsic value in teaching is the same. The intrinsic like struggle of doing this well and the intrinsic like um, uh, desire to support students. And actually, I was just thinking that. One of the things you're sharing is that students, just simply having students and the focus on students is a shared context, right? So I appreciate I appreciate you lifting that as well. Okay. So um, so but let's let's lift up. So what what are the differences you see that are important here to talk about when we talk about teaching improvement? What kinds of differences do we need to highlight across these three faculty? You know, expectations from students of what great teaching comprises and expectations from the administration of what excellent teaching looks like. Absolutely. So students in these different kinds of contexts might have very different expectations. We also know that students have differing expectations of faculty depending on the racial and gender and other kinds of identities. So that plays into their experience here. Um, and certainly how in administration thinks about great college teaching and priority prioritizes great college teaching and not just administration but how how different kinds of institutions and institutional types value that right so really different being in a research university than being in a liberal arts college for example so um, factors related to power in the university and remuneration related to being an adjunct or early career tenure track or tenured or term here. Absolutely, so faculty category and the way that intersects with power in higher education. And to lift up, I also see on the chat gender and racial differences between the instructors. So not just how the students you know, uh, uh, put an emphasis on those teachers, but also their daily experiences and lived experiences of being in higher education and in ac academia. So I think you all got a lot of them. Um, discipline, this is one that I feel like we ignore often. Um, there are extreme disciplinary differences in terms of the paradigms and assumptions that are brought to bear and how that, how that um, changes teaching improvement. Um, and, and the other piece is course context, right? So a faculty member teaching um, in a very large lecture hall, right? I mean, we literally call it a lecture hall. So they're, you know, you're going to think you're teaching in a lecture, right? Um, uh, versus these smaller seminar, uh, seminar style contexts. Um, that also has an important bearing on teaching improvement. And too often we treat all teaching improvement, you know, in one, one shape and size. Okay. All right. So, so I want to try something, um, which is uh, relate. I haven't done yet before, so this this could work or it could not work. <laughs> um, so, so there's two things that I wanted to talk through here. So one is, and and I appreciate. So something you all should know is that we're in a university where when we say we're going to give a book talk, the the facilitation guidelines are about interaction and about um, you know, what is it like to do good presenting and what is it like to do presenting in a way that informs learners. So I'm really trying to mix it up a little bit here and try things differently than I'm doing in other talks. So you all are, are a little bit of the test case here. <laughs> um, and, and much appreciation to CTRL for, for, for um, fostering that thinking. So, um, so, so in, this, in this conversation and in this book, I do a lot of discussion around whether teaching is valued or not in higher education. And so, um, so I, I'd like to do an activity. So I'd like to ask everyone in the room to, to if, you're, if you are able to stand up, if you're not able to um, lift your arm, okay? Um, and, and if you're not able to lift your arm, then, we'll, then 
we'll find other ways, but basically to, to, to make yourself known, okay? So if you're able, if not, please raise your hand. Online, can you all start with all your online hands raised? So we're trying to get a visual here. <laughs> and also um, uh, for inclusion reasons, um, I will also like say what I'm seeing so that folks um, who might not be able to see visually can hear. All right. So what I would say is, um, so as of right now, everyone um, in the room has made themselves known um, by standing or otherwise. And online, we're starting with like three quarters with hands raised. So just, just to give a sense, all right? <laughs> all right, so, so stay, san and please know that what, I, what I'm sharing here will not identify any person that is having a problem with their teaching but is intended to, to identify our whole system of higher education and the way it va values or devalues teaching and teaching improvement, okay? So if you sit, there's no shame, okay? <laughs> or if you pull down your hand. So, so if you pull down your hand, there's no shame. So stay standing or keep your hands raised if you are at a university that uses multiple measures to assess teaching quality in promotion, reappointment and tenure decisions. So wonderful. So first of all, we are all at such a university, right? Now we should recognize this is not the norm, right? This is not the norm. Many universities across the country use only teaching evaluations to measure teaching. And um, so not only do we, is that the case here at AU, but everyone here is familiar that that is, that that is the case. So that's great to hear. One for one. So if you have had at least one conversation about college teaching in the past week, stay standing or keep your hands raised. At least one conversation. All right. And it, please, there's no shame. Remember, this is around the culture of teaching. So if you have not, it may be due to your role. It, it is likely due to the culture that we have in higher education. All right, so um, so we have some hands that went down and some and some people in the room that went down. So if you took a course on college teaching during your graduate studies, stay standing or stay with your hands raised. Ooh. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay. On on. Yeah, it should be college teaching, college teaching. All right, so at this point, we have one still standing in the room and five with hands raised online. Just so you know, I'm only halfway through the list. Because, and the reason that I say that is that for us to truly demonstrate that we are a system of higher education that values teaching and values college teaching, all of these things should be happening. All right. So next one, if you felt teaching was highly valued in your job search process, stay with your, stay standing or stay with your hand up. If it was highly valued, it was highly valued. So can I stand back up again? Or? <laughs> no, no, because we're trying to see like how many have all of these. All right, how many have all? So we've got four still remaining online and we've got three still standing in person. If you have been at a department meeting where faculty talked about teaching improvement, stay standing or stay with your hand raised. All right, we've got three still standing and uh, six online. If you have participated in a faculty learning community about teaching, remain standing or remain, remain with your hand raised. Faculty learning community. Now we've got four online, three still standing here. If you have been at, at at least one university, so we're not gonna single out AU here. If you have been at at least one university where teaching is highly valued in promotion or tenure or reappointment, stay standing or stay with your hand raised. I might count AU, but I think we could, debate that. <laughs> so, so great. I think everybody remained. All right. We, we could have a whole discussion on that, right? All right. 
And then the last one, if you feel that teaching excellence gives you academic capital in your faculty career, remain standing or keep your hand raised. Does teaching excellence give you academic capital in your faculty career? Is there anybody standing who isn't in education? <laughs> Great question. So we had a question in the room. Can you actually can online folks hear the question questions in the room? You should repeat it just okay. in case. Okay, great. So the question was, is there anyone still standing or with their hands raised who is not in education? Oh, great. I'm glad you can hear well. That's great. So I think that we have seen maybe a common, and I'm not sure, with the hands raised, are, are you, so I know at least two, uh, uh, are intersect with education. It looks like there might be one person that I'm, I don't know if you're in education or not. And my apologies if I'm, if I'm not familiar with you. So, 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 all right, have a seat. Thank you all so much for, for, for giving that a try. Okay. So the great news is that here at AU, we still have some folks standing, right? We still have some folks, um, although it looks like maybe there's some education connections there, right? Um, who, who can say yes across the board. Now I will say, I think that that, is, uh, that would be the, uh, the case at a minority of universities across the nation. And so, so given that, given that we're in this system that mostly devalues, um, devalues teaching, uh, we really need to get this broader view that we don't typically get. We need to have a better sense of where great college teaching is happening, and also to learn from people outside our disciplines, right? Like this is another question I could have asked, you know, how often, how many people have had the opportunity to observe somebody teaching who is not in their discipline, right? I think few, few folks might've been able to stay stand. I'm gonna add that one for next time. <laughs> um, all right, so, so in, in my research, um, we examined more than 700 courses through, uh, through observation a structured observation protocol where we were rating the effectiveness of the pedagogy um, on these uh, teaching practices that you can see here. All of these teaching practices have been connected in the past to student learning and, um, and uh, have both evidence in, typically started the evidence in K-12, so always want to acknowledge those K-12 roots. Um, uh, but have been translated into higher education teaching and have shown prom, uh, promise and also shown evidence of um, improving student learning. And the, the 700 plus courses that we observed were across nine colleges and universities. And because I was really interested in different kinds of institutional contexts, I sampled these institutions to examine teaching in really different institutions. And really, I was also very interested specifically in this question of prestige and how um, college teaching interacts with prestige. So uh, we have three highly ranked universities that are very, very, very different kinds of institutions. Um, we have two that would be mid-ranked master's universities that I would describe as striving universities. So inst institutions that are trying to move in the rankings or trying to increase their research pro pro protocol uh, profile. I think this is especially important for AU, given that we've moved from R3 to R2, and there's been you know, some discussions about continued research emphasis. And so I think there's really interesting interaction with teaching there. And then two, what I would consider broad access uh, uh, public colleges and two broad access private liberal arts colleges. And when I say broad access, I mean non-selective, um, non-selective institutions. Important to acknowledge what's missing in this sample. Um, minority serving institutions were not included. And so that is ripe for, um, for further research. Community colleges, I cannot wait to study community colleges as a context. I think they will be really important to this agenda. And I think for-profit colleges would also be an interesting site for research, but not included here. Okay, so, so what do we learn about college teaching with this expanded view? Um, so there's, a, a, and many of you may be familiar with this. Uh, I know that there are several college teaching experts in this room, both virtual and uh, here in this space. 
So you probably heard about the growing chorus of literature um, and practitioners that are proponent of active learning um, that in the literature base really has been contrasted with didactic lecture. So it's really been put into two buckets and pitted these two against each other, active learning and lecture, and, and really stated that these are sort of opposing forces. Faculty should move away from lecture and use active learning practices. And, um, and I think this broader map, understanding these more than seven, uh, 700 courses can give us an expanded view about this. So let's take a look at the data. Um, what does this lecture and active learning dichotomy look like in practice? And what you'll see here is that it is still the case that almost all courses included a lecture. We have about 90% of courses um, containing a lecture. Um, and so this might seem to indicate that institutions have not learned from the active learning literature base, but yet, we see 64% of courses did include an activity in their course, and 44% of courses included student discussions. So it appears, at least in how lecture manifests in classrooms, this is not an either or practice. And I think we really need to think about that when we're conceptualing great college teaching, that it might be that a mini lecture could really well serve students before we engage in the content, or even as a part of it, maybe we start out with the student discussions and get a sense of what students' prior knowledge is about the topic, how they interact with the content culturally from their lived experiences. Maybe then we lift up a mini lecture, what scholars know about this, Maybe we do some culturally relevant teaching and question what scholars haven't asked and which scholars were, were, were thinking about these topics and how that intersects with lived experiences and cultures. And then maybe we dive into an activity that helps students to deeply apply that material and think about how that material might apply in their own lived contexts and cultures. So, so meaning this is not either or, and we can't treat these practices as either or, even though so much literature has treated these topics as such. Great. So this is actually a graph that I have presented in another um, presentation here, but it was like four years ago. So I'm lifting it up again because it is a part of the book and I think it's really fascinating. Um, so this is a lot um, and, uh, Actually, do you know what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try and do both, point it out on the screen and then point it out um, on my screen share. But what I wanna draw your, first I'm gonna point it out in the, in the room and then I'm gonna point it out on the screen share. So, so what you'll see here, um, all of these lines represent a different group of courses. This was done through latent class analysis. And basically what latent class analysis does is it sees how, how the, the different courses act in terms of like, really a cluster of teaching behaviors, okay? So we're pulling these, these so, so each of these lines represents a, sep a separate group of courses. And then you can see how those courses behave by looking down here at this x-axis. So, um, so if the course, if the group of courses was likely to have class activities, you would see them, you know, up higher on the probability here. And if it um, is less likely to have class activities, you'll see it lower down here. So let's just, and I'm just gonna do that really quickly here. So you all on the screen, can you see my pointer? Can someone give me a thumbs up if you can see my pointer on the screen? You can? Yeah. Okay, fantastic. So, um, so what you'll see here is, so down here in this key, you will see um, these are groups of courses down here. And, up on this x-axis here, you can see the different, the different kinds of behaviors that, that happened in that class. So for example, here with class activities, these groups of courses were likely to enact class activities, and this one was not. So, so what that means is that, um, so let's just take a couple examples. 
So in, in this sample of courses, and just to acknowledge, these were institutions that were willing to have me, right, um, come. So these are probably institutions that are focusing more on teaching. I think you're probably seeing a rosy picture than we would see if I was able to just drop in on any university I wanted to see. So just to name that limitation. But so we have 55% of this sample that I would consider comprehensive. So they are prob they're likely to do all the behaviors you see down on the screen, right? So if we look at this, this green group here, right? So they're likely to have a class activity, a class discussion. They're having students ask questions. They do have a lecture, extremely likely to have a lecture. They have, this says subject matter knowledge, but this is about the depth of subject matter knowledge. We actually know a lot about um, uh, if we do, too much content, not deeply, students learn little. If we take the core ideas and we understand them really deeply and we have multiple representations of them and we think about how they cognitively map onto different ideas, students learn it much more deeply. So this measure is about the depth of subject matter knowledge and how that's being discussed. So those comprehensive courses are doing that as well. They're eliciting students' prior knowledge and they're supporting students both cognitively and emotionally in their learning process. So those comprehensive courses are really doing a lot in that space. But we still do have 19% of these courses that would be what I would consider traditional lecture. So they're not having class discussion, they're not likely to have class activities, um, but they do have students asking questions, sort of call and response. They've got a lecture, and, um, and they're focused on depth of subject matter knowledge, which isn't a problem, except they're not connecting it to students' prior knowledge. They are not supporting students emotionally and cognitively in their learning. So they've got that really sort of traditional um, approach to teaching. But then there's all these other patterns that we need to learn more about. My favorite here is the active, the group that I, I call active and aimless here, um, because, because my, you know, I really feel for this group. This group is trying to do the right thing, right? They have heard that, you know, that active learning is where it's at, and they have tried to take that, that on, right? But the pro this is where that dichotomy is such a problem, because the message that simply taking on active learning is enough really does not do justice to the active learning movement, because active learning is not just having a class activity but it is deeply connecting it to students' lives. It is deeply connecting it to the subject matter, right? And, and, and really, you know, um, co collaborative learning, right? There's so many elements of active learning that need to be engaged in this process for it to be really meaningful for students. And so what we saw for this, it's not a ton of classes, it's 5%, right? But for these 5% of those 700 plus classes, we have faculty you know, who were giving students an activity. And I remember being in those classes and looking at it and thinking, what is the subject of this class? You know, I couldn't even figure it out. I had to go back and look at the course title to figure out what we're supposed to be learning here. You know, um, so, so, it is, um, so it's wonderful to, uh, you know, this is what the broader view helps us to, to think about and to see. All right. So, so let's also take a look. How, how effective are, were faculty across our sample on these different um, teaching practices? Uh, so not surprisingly, so uh, pedagogical content knowledge is, is, is really the marriage between understanding pedagogy and understanding the content, right? It really tells us that, that different disciplines have different understandings, different assumptions, and different core ideas. And those should be taught in specific ways. So teaching math is not the same as teaching history, right? Teaching an education is not going to be the same as even teaching sociology, right? Um, there are intersections, there are ways that these intersect, but really um, uh, pedagogical content knowledge is, um, uh, is important to consider. And across the, across the board, across institutions uh, of the frameworks that we examined, um, faculty were strongest in this area. Given how much has been discussed about active learning, it was less pervasive than expected. 
Now, you might be wondering, wait a second, just a second ago, we saw that 60 something percent included an activity. So we had a different framework that talked about the effectiveness of that active learning approach. So how deeply were students engaged? How long were they engaged? Was, was it connected to the subject matter? Was it connected to their lived experiences, right? It really looked at the, 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 the ways in which we might understand uh, really deep forms of active engagement and active learning. And uh, so unfortunately, um, faculty were, were less, uh, pervasively understanding and using uh, effective active learning practices. This is extremely disappointing. Culturally relevant teaching and the use of students' prior knowledge was, a, in, was rated on average. So there's, of course, different you know, uh, courses that, that came out better than this, but um, on average uh, as ineffective. So the mean on this is ineffective which really shows that we are at the beginning of this journey um, in higher education. So this one is interesting in terms of class climate. Um, so in addition to the observations, we also surveyed students and surveyed faculty. And um, class climate is actually better tapped through survey than it is through observation. Um, and so uh, it's, a, it's a perceptual measure, right? So. Um, so, uh, so what's interesting is faculty believe that their climate is positive. The students say moderately, moderately. So they're not saying it's negative, but it's also not what they would consider positive. And this is on average, but I think this is important, right? So us as faculty, as we're teaching and thinking about how our class climate, just remember that however you're think, you think it's feeling, it's actually a little worse, <laughs> So typically, typically. All right, so, um, and I'm just looking at the time and I'm just thinking about where I wanna go with this. So um, we have uh, some findings on the intersection of prestige and the quality of teaching. So, and when I'm talking about prestige in higher education, I'm largely talking about the, the connection between uh, rankings like US News um, and Carnegie classification, which as you all know, privileges research and therefore, uh, garners more funding for, the, for, for institutions. So I think this is a really interesting question, right? I'm wondering, uh, before we go into the why, what do you all think? Do you think it is the highly ranked? And some of you have heard me talk about this. So if you know, if you know already what the research says, please don't chime in. <laughs> but for those of you who haven't heard me talk about this before, um, where is the, the most, the best teaching which we know to be student-centered teaching that connects to active learning, uh, students' lived experiences, their prior knowledge, right? Where is that happening? Is that happening more, off, more frequently at the most highly ranked universities, at the broad access universities, or at the universities that are in the struggle, like striving to be more in the ranking, so in the middle? What do you all think? And feel free online to, to chime in. All right, so tell me more about that. Why do you think broad access? I guess the, the major sort of identity of that those types of schools is serving the students that are enrolled there. So I would hope that the, there'd be more resources devoted to teaching. All right, so, and just to make sure, I think that online folks can hear, but just in case. Um, so the idea was broad access institutions because there's more of a mission centered focus on teaching and teaching diverse students. And so that should play into teaching. I'm curious, does anyone think the opposite way? Kehoe. I think the opposite because I think those institutions tend, tend to be under-resourced. Yeah. So um, great teaching, you know, intersects also with resources. And we know the highly ranked institutions definitely have more resources. All right, uh, Luis in the chat says broad access. Um, Luis, do you want to expand upon that? No pressure. If you don't want to, don't you know? Don't worry. Um, I thought I did, but then Kehoe brought up a good point, <laughs> and I know uh, you know Kehoe has spent some time at FIU, which is another broad access uh, institution that I've also spent time in. But uh, 
yeah, now I'm a little uncertain, but I, I, I feel like still sometimes broad access, there's more opportunities to take some chances, right? As, as, as far as the faculty member themselves making these decisions, right? Maybe not institutional wise, but in that micro level. Thank you so much for that, Luis. Would anyone else like to share? Great, Amara and then to Dr. Pichol. So I'm looking at it as the, the problem with prestigious universities <laughs> is that folks know that they are prestigious, which means that folks have assumptions about the intellectual capacity of those students, which might mean that you can slide on the need to lecture and engage more actively because you see these students as being ready for that type of engaged learning. And I don't think that broad access students get the benefit of that doubt or assumption. Uh, yeah, so that's, had thought about Kehoe's point, but I'm thinking of folks might just be, you know, taking it easy in the top or notch schools because we assume so much about those students. I so appreciate that, Amara. And I think there are so many assumptions about who goes to what school, right? And what that means about their ability to engage in the classroom. And does that create a self-fulfilling prophecy? Is it, would you say that it's also the pressure to publish at those prestigious universities? And they, instead of putting the emphasis on the faculty to teach, they end up leaving it to graduate students. So as, I mean, I remember as a grad student, as a doc student, it was the focus that I had to teach instead of my advisor teaching. So yeah. that's that's the case, and I'm coming from an R1. So and I so I'm really hearing, you know, oh, it could be this on this broad access side. Wait, it could be this on that, right? So there's so, but I think the the emphasis on research is something we really need to consider at those high prestige institutions, Dr. Pashola. Yes. Um. So. Yes to what they said, so I'm not going to repeat that. Um, I wasn't an R1, and I remember when you're going up for tenure for promotion, mm -hmm. it's research, mm -hmm. teaching, um, and, and community service slash dissemination. Mm -hmm. So as they said, they prioritize. But I think the other thing is, as we talk about um, prestige intersecting with the quality of teaching, I'm looking at it from the perspective of students, first generation students students coming from small communities, when they do the tour of the school, it's amazing. But when they come to the school, to what extent do they actually have access to those amazing professors, you know? And what is the extent to which you might have, you know, top honor scholars and all that who will come to your institution and because of lack of access to that professor, because professors can buy their time out mm -hmm. and the emphasis is really a publishing, what does that do to the quality of the students, to the students who graduate, right? So they come, they're amazing when they get here. And the first thing that they want to do, separate from research and other things, they really want to learn. And sometimes we have incredible faculty members, but whose main priority is something other than getting teachers, which then negatively influences many of the first gen or the, the, the students who want that knowledge. Thank you so much. I hope the online folks could hear, um, uh, and I know that it sounds like folks can hear, but just to lift up that it's not, it's not just having you know, brilliant faculty there, but it's also the access that students have to those faculty and the ways in which, especially first-generation students who are navigating a whole system that they have not, necessarily, you know, be, you know, been grown up into, right? Um, that, that they have mechanisms for that access and support for that access. And so where would that happen? And, oh, Rob, do you um, Yeah, if I could just add one thing, I think it's, um, for, I think for a lot of the, the reasons that were just stated, um, a few years back, it was um, the, uh, the Obama administration was pursuing higher education accountability. And it was like really trendy. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this. Raj Chetty did some research on this over the New York Times. And they were looking at um, colleges and universities that were engines of socioeconomic mobility, which is a function of a lot more than quality of teaching, but I think quality of teaching 
is certainly a factor in that. And, you know, uh, it was a very much in vogue a few years ago that like uh, the CUNY system really stood out in, in, that, in that research, the Cal State system, um, uh, UT El Paso um, was sort of like an outlier um, just in terms of like, like institutions that, that really like just change life trajectories for students. Thank you so much for, for raising that, um, Rob, as well. I think um, we know that there is a deep connection between the quality of teaching and student outcomes. And so that then connects to workforce as well, right? So, um, and I have to say, and I, want, uh, I also want to lift up what's on the chat, um, uh, which uh, says, uh, they say, I think there would be a lot of variability in teaching quality across all universities, regardless of prestige which is also true, right? So we can have a teaching supportive culture at a research university, and we could have a non-teaching supportive culture at a liberal arts college, right? Um, so we can talk about trends, and we also need to talk about the universities that are basically bucking those trends. But I have to say, this, this discussion has been so robust, and it's like you all were in my head as I was developing this agenda, because you know, on the one hand, research universities and prestigious universities have resources, right? And that they have the assumptions that students are better prepared or more traditionally prepared, we should say, right? And on the other hand, they they have all of the, the pressure for, for search and tenure. And we know that, you know, dollar for dollar, every hour that they spend on research, their salary increases, but every hour they spend on teaching, their salary is more likely to decrease. So, so they have these polls, right? And we have broad access institutions that have this mission, you know, driven, focused on students, focused on the local community, focus on, um, you know, so much that might be great fodder for teaching in the classroom. What would it be? You know, usually when you go forth with a research agenda, you really have a sense of like, I really think it's this way. But when we went to examine this, I, to be honest, just like you all, I really wasn't sure which way it would go. Or, um, you know, like online, you know, maybe it doesn't matter at all. You know, maybe maybe it's something else completely. So, but um, and we just talked through all this, so I'm gonna skip these slides. Let's get to the meat. So, what did we find? <laughs> um, so, um, so what I think is really fascinating is that the results show so much of what you just shared. So, let's look at cognitive complexity. Here we see what. Uh, also, actually, I forgot to name this, but when I ask people who are not higher educators about this question. The answer is, well, of course, the highly ranked universities have the best teaching, right? So asking folks outside of higher ed, they have no sense that there's a tension here. Of course, the highly ranked universities have the best teaching, right? So, so interestingly, with cognitive complexity, right? So how, how deep is the subject, is the content? Are we talking about it in terms of like rote memorization only? Are they able to do memorizing but also apply? Are they analyzing the material? Are they hypothesizing their own ideas? Right, so, so how cognitively complex is the material in the classroom? The high prestige institutions were higher in this, in this respect. But I have to call out Dr. DeCure's hypothesis here because I believe that this is not because the students are not capable in those spaces, but I believe that there's a poor self-fulfilling prophecy going on that we need to correct in both spaces, right? So, so you know, it may not be the case that all students entering highly ranked universities are ready for that depth of complexity. Likewise, and this is where I would challenge more, this is where I would challenge some of the broad access institutions, you know, where are we bringing in deficit mindsets that are not allowing us to deepen that subject matter for those students in a way that's more meaningful. This one I think is fascinating. So when we talk about the depth of subject matter, so many people would assume the research universities that are highly prestigious would be doing this better in the classroom. But this interacts with exactly what folks share here, right? Which is that so often, and I'm not saying graduate students can't do a great job with in-depth subject matter, but we actually know that um, expertise with teaching, this comes out of K-12, but it definitely applies to higher ed as well. When we've had years of teaching, we better understand how the discipline maps, the ideas across the discipline maps, how they work with different kinds of students, right? So we just have more ex more experience with teaching. It allows us to do it more deeply, right? So, so, so what I think is really interesting here is we may have folks that may be really knowledgeable about one aspect of the field, 
but they are not giving more depth to the subject matter for the students in the highly ranked universities than the broad access. It's actually the same across. So very similar across the board. And keep in mind, I'm talking about trends. So this goes to the common online. There, there could be institutions or courses even within those institutions that are different, but I'm just talking about broad trends right now. And what I think is really fascinating is this finding, which is that the, the um, kinds of pedagogies that are more student-centered that we know are especially important for equity-based teaching. So being able to connect the subject matter to students' prior knowledge and supporting students both cognitively and emotionally when they experience dissonance in their learning process, that is more likely to happen in the broad access institutions. Perhaps because of what was shared here in terms of those institutions having a stronger mission-centered um, focus on students, on broader diversity of students, and on teaching. All right, so, so, but we have this issue, right? We have this issue, which is that teaching in so many ways is systematically devalued in higher education. When we think about where philanthropy is, although we're starting to see some changes, so I want to acknowledge the improvements we're seeing, right? So NSF has started to fund some college teaching and improvement initiatives. But outside of those, there is so much philanthropy going to research, going to other areas, but so little that is going to, um, that, it, that is going to college teaching improvement. And therefore, that means that faculty are less likely to get grants for that, which is deeply rewarded in tenure promotion, reappointment, hiring, and just generally academic capital. Rankings and external measures of quality are not valuing teaching. We also know, those of you in the School of Ed or those of you who have done any K-12 teaching will know that society does not value teaching. We can just take one look at salary, uh, salaries of teachers to know that. So broader societal norms around whether teaching is important also fall on the devaluing side. So there is so much, you know, I, I, I feel like this, um, <laughs> this person here, you know, who is wanting to do teaching improvement is just buried under the weight of so much that is devaluing. And we're leaving it to intr intrinsic motivation of institutions who do care. I'm not saying institutions don't care about supporting students, but institutions themselves do not have the structures, do not have the rewards, will not garner rankings, will not garner additional funding, will not garner prestige in other ways, will not garner additional enrollments if they can prove, which they can't, that their teaching excellence has improved, right? So even if we have the intrinsic motivation as faculty and as institutions, we do not have a broader structure to support teaching improvement. And so I just wanna call out, I think that the Centers for Teaching, Research and Learning like we have here um, are, are doing the real work and the real meat of this going against the grain in so many ways. And so any kind of teaching improvement that we see you know, should really feel like you all are being champions in this really challenging context. We're gonna talk about the public in a minute. So the public does not value teaching at K-12 teaching in terms of the, um, you know, the way we, we monetize valuing, right? But at the same time, we'll, we'll just put a pin in that for a minute. Okay, so we've been talking about this. Teaching and prestige have largely and traditionally been bifurcated in academia, which causes just so many problems around teaching improvement. And at the same time, teaching improvement is happening. And um, it may seem almost impossible to imagine that private research universities, um, especially those who are highly ranked, would or could improve their culture for teaching or become exemplary teaching institutions. But this is actually happening. And um, I just wanted to mention that the book goes into great detail about the spaces where there are research universities that have taken teaching improvement to task. Um, and the book really focuses on individual, collegial, and organizational levers that can be used to improve teaching. 
So individual, I'm thinking about one-on-one -on -one kinds of faculty strategies, collegial. So actually, when we had you all stand up or raise hands, we were talking about approaches at the individual, collegial, and organizational levers, right? So, so collegial would be those department meetings, right, where those conversations are happening. When we're having conversations in the hallways, you know, when I asked you to think back over the past week, have you talked about teaching, right? That's a collegial lever. And then organizational levers, we're talking about reward structures for individual faculty, but, but also for institutions, that we really need to focus on that organizational lever, level as well. And, and a sneak preview from the book is that we actually have a lot of research that talks about the individual level, lever to improve, right? So one-on-one -on -one faculty coaching, um, faculty going to CTRLs to improve their teaching, to talk through their mid-semester evals. Those are the one-on-one -on -one practices. We have a lot of research that talks about what would need to happen organizationally, although universities have largely not taken those on, right? But the piece that I feel like has been missed and is the heartbeat for research universities like AU, AU has done this way better than most, so let me acknowledge that, but is this collegial? this collegial space, right? What are we doing in departments? The Boyer 2030 Commission has really lifted up that space, the space of the department as being a really important lever, but it's not just department. We know that in higher, I mean, so many of us are in higher education because you know we act differently organizationally, right? We care a lot about peers. We care a lot, I mean, think about the peer review process, right? We care a lot about what faculty to faculty say. This, this is related to faculty governance as well. But when we get faculty talking about teaching, that's when we see improvement. Okay. So, so what can administrators do? And um, I just wanna separate out right now two kinds of institutions. And the book goes into great detail about this. But, and and I, I'm separating them. We know that it's not, it's not obviously two categories. There's some that are maybe in, in the middle. Maybe AU might be in the middle, to be honest, right? Um, but, um, but, but I wanna look at these two groups separately because I don't think we've really thought about teaching improvement as a movement. We've talked about it as a, an institution or as a faculty member ourselves. But if we are going to improve teaching across higher education as a movement, we are going to need to consider what it means to be a teaching supportive institution in a context that is not teaching supportive. And we need to consider what it means if you are a university that has not been a teaching supportive institution and what it means to do this kind of work in that context. So if we are in a teaching supportive institution, perhaps AU might fall more on this end, although there's work to do, we need to make ourselves known as such. We need to be able to demonstrate our teaching prowess. And historically, higher education institutions have not been all for making teaching quality transparent. We believe in autonomy. We believe in the fact that there's something about um, that higher education that we don't want accountability. And I think that that's important for a, a number of different reasons, including academic freedom. But there is something about being able to demonstrate that as a university, we are doing this better than most. And the way that teaching improvement connects to our democracy and our role as higher education institutions to serve our democracy and to ser serve the social good, we need to be thinking about how we can, how we can show that. And, um, and that might mean within an institution, but it also might mean, you know, we need to have you know, some kind of, of system that's broader than just one institution to be able to show this. And just to give one example of that, across the study, there was one institution that really stood out. And this goes back to the comment earlier. So across the broad access institutions, the ones that were generally more supportive of, uh, of student-focused teaching, um, there was, even within that group, there was one institution that truly stood out. And this was a broad access liberal arts institution in a rural area that was struggling with enrollments and considered a fourth choice institution for most students who were there. 
So when I went to present the findings to the faculty meeting there, the, the, the faculty was, it was not a good climate. They were feeling like, before I showed the results, they were feeling like they were in an institution that was you know, not thriving, barely surviving, right? Enrollments were down, resources are low. Can we keep the doors open? At the same time, they felt that there was something special about teaching there. And I would talk to faculty, they would talk to me about how they came specifically to this institution because of the hiring practices, because of the culture, because everybody was talking about teaching. So I came and presented these findings and I was able to demonstrate that their faculty were teaching more effectively on these frameworks that support student learning and on the equity-based frameworks than even the most highly ranked private research university in my sample. Now, I, I couldn't give them that information to prove, so I couldn't tell them what the other university was. Imagine what a tool that would have been, right? If this college could say, you know, and at this time I was at Columbia University. Columbia University study says, you know, this institution has better teaching practices than this other private research university highly ranked, right? But they didn't have that tool. So they used it internally. They created a messaging campaign across the university to say, yes, we have something special here. And I don't know whether this was the thing, I'm sure they did a, you know, a million different things to improve enrollments and other things, but I can say that Seven years later, after that data collection, that institution, and when I talk to the faculty there, feels that they know that they are special in a way that they didn't previously. So, so it's important that teaching supportive institutions know that they are special and can prove that. We need to improve culturally responsive and equity-based teaching. So this, this is something that is really dire. And we can't say, you know, I hear all the time, like, we can't make that change in STEM. We can't make that change because my tenure requirements, we can't make that change because I teach in this, you know, 200 person lecture hall. But the truth is that we won't, right? Because we couldn't do all the, we couldn't move our courses online, but we did, right? We just don't feel like it's urgent enough. And I just want to lift the urgency around culturally responsive and equity-based teaching. And we can also serve an ex as an exemplar to work with other institutions to improve our teaching. Universities that have miles to go really have a different agenda. They need to focus on collegial levers, use traditional academic prestige tools to improve reward structures. Let's create endowed chairs that are endowed teaching chairs rather than research chairs. Let's use what we know works for prestige in those areas. And we need to capitalize on that high resource position for teaching at those institutions. And so I'm going to, I know we're getting towards the end here. The very last thing I'm going to share with you all is that the public does believe this. When we ask a random sample of the U.S. public, um, this is both folks who have been engaged in higher education, meaning have a degree, and those who don't. This is across race and gender. Um, when we ask them what's the most important factor and what makes the best college or university, they answer, it has excellent teachers. Unfortunately, that's not how the system works right now. <laughs> but we do have the support of the public. And actually, I just wrote an op-ed that came out today in USA Today. Please take a look at that. I think part of our work here to make this a movement is to help the public lift up teaching just as much as they care. And so I will stop here and take any questions. Um, and, uh, and really, thank you all so much for letting me present this work. Let me just actually get here, um, please. Uh, would love to, <laughs> this is important. Um, if you all are interested in hearing more, you know, specifically about how um, colleges can do this teaching improvement work and do it well, and what are the data that support it, um, please. Uh, Buy the book. Um, here's a, a sales code and this um, QR code uh, will take you right there. So thank you all so much and I'm happy to take questions. Please. Can you go back to that? So this is, this is sweat, so I'll Yeah. And laughter. Can you go back to that 
you go back to that last slide. So I, 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 I don't know. But the last thing on the list? Uh -huh. Sports scenes. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we have other to put it on. Than, other than leave me behind me. A whole bunch of all one schools also have incredible sports teams, or at least put a sign on the north end of the sports team. Yeah. So, okay. This is fascinating, yeah. right? Because actually, so <laughs> I, I asked a bunch of higher ed scholars before I knew the results here what they thought would emerge. So the number one the thing that higher ed scholars thought would emerge was about salary. So they thought salary would be number one, salary of its graduates, right? Um, and they thought, uh, which ended up being third to bottom. Yeah. And um, uh, and we had I had several scholars who who said this will be high up somewhere. <laughs> now keep in mind, this didn't ask them what factors help you decide on the school you want to go to, right? Because that might be different. Mm -hmm. But this is asking them what they think is the best university, right? Best might be different than fit what they believe as fit. But I think it's fascinating because when we think of prestige, it's supposed to be associated with best, right? US News purports to rank the best colleges. College teaching is not a measure on the rankings. Zero measures of college teaching. Yeah. But also the fourth from the bottom. <laughs> uh, yes, but um, 50%, I actually thought that was better than I expected. Yeah, 50% said that that was very important. Yeah. Researchers. Yeah, Jennifer, Dr. Steele. So, Corbin, thank you so much for this presentation. Um, I am picturing some classes that I've attended um, as a student where there is a mindset that if I have to explain the 10 equations on this slide, you don't belong in this class. And this is a big thing, not just in, that was econometrics, but this is a big thing in many disciplines, medical school, pre-med, and the assumption is we are here to weed people out yes. and get the best, get the quote, uh, which is very, you know, it's obviously very culturally biased. It's, it's the antithesis of teaching. But that culture is very hard to move. Do you think that that is moving? And how do we move it? So that's a great question. I, I think, um, I, I wish that I had a more rosy perspective on that. But I feel like that ties to our frameworks around students' prior knowledge, right? Because we have to lift up that knowledge, work with it, connect it to the subject matter, right? So the perspective you're bringing up is, I don't care about your prior knowledge. If you're not here, you're not here, right? Um, and so what we see is that, um, that, that, you know, prior knowledge is one of those frameworks that on average is, is rated as in, what was rated as ineffective by our raters. So their most faculty are not, you know, are not acknowledging lifting up and supporting students prior knowledge. Um, and I think this is the thing, right? If, if we had more reward structures supporting faculty innovation around teaching, those faculty would have to figure it out, right? They would have to figure it out. But right now we can have those faculty and if they are doing amazing things, researching the micro area in their discipline, they could get tenure, right? They for sure have tenure. They're yeah. the most famous uh, people. Right, yeah. <laughs> that's right. Rob. I'd say oh, it's and even, then I, there's something online too. I'd say it's even worse than that in the sense that, you know, the I think one of the things the faculty are responding to in that case is like the incentives that they face under the current mm -hmm. system. And one of the biases we know exists in student student surveys, student evaluations of teaching is that they rate courses higher, like lower if they think the course was too hard. And so one of the ways faculty respond to that is by getting the students who are going to think the course is too hard to drop. Um, and so I think, um, I don't know, I think changing, changing how faculty are evaluated and you know what what is considered a good course or trying to um evaluate how much students learn in the course as opposed to just you know did they did they basically already come in knowing everything they're supposed to know so connected to the 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 multiple evaluations of teaching right and if we switch to that teaching portfolio approach i can guarantee you the faculty who are doing those observations would see that as a plus and not as a minus right yeah thank you for that 
Oh, and I'm sorry. Yeah, can I do the online real quick? Um, so um, we have an online comment, curious as to exper um, experiential learning and service or community-based learning and where it ranks in terms of the effective teaching practices you found. So that is a great question. And I will say we would have seen those as an example. I'm trying to think about where that would definitely have shown up in our active learning measure. Um, but we didn't have a separate special, like a specific measure for experiential learning um, uh, and service in community-based learning. And I feel like it would be fascinating. I, I would love, um, you know, in the next iteration, you know, to be able to chart that course. Yes, exactly. Yes, it would be great to explore that in future research. If you're interested, let me know. Maybe we can work together on it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, because the question is, you know, we have a little sense of whether prior knowledge, whether culturally relevant teaching is happening, whether active learning is happening. But the question around, you know, is community based learning happening? You know, what percentage of courses? It's a great question. Oh, and one more thing. Unfortunately, we can't just survey faculty to know that because um, faculty over report the practices that they're using comparatively to observations. I wish, I wish it were that easy, but we really have to go in and observe. <laughs> um, oh, please. So next to uh, Dr. Shan and Dr. Steele, you were saying, okay, so what if faculty members were incentivized that they would be able to better meet these prior knowledge needs of, of their students and be more effective teaching. But we could also blame the institutional structures and say that the structures are set up, like you said earlier, we don't know the outcome of students after we've taught them. We don't know the precursors of students before we get them, right? And in K-12, we do. In higher ed, we don't, right? And so we've built this structure to be very isolated. Um, but the question I was gonna have for you, on the slide where you have lecture, as a measure and then active learning as a measure and you got the percentages and active and like lecturing was 80 something four percent. I'm curious what the definition of a lecture um, and how do you make sense of those classes that are designed as lectures and the activity is supposed to take place in the discussion lab or the what do you call it? Um, What's the word? A different universe. I don't know what they call it here. Seminar, discussion room, like Yes, where you know the lecture takes place here, but right. you know to get the delayed effect of the activity over here. So we did observe both the lecture and the discussion section. Um, so that I think helps with that. But uh, so lecture, we did define lecture in a didactic way uh, because we were interested in what proportion of faculty were doing that like very didactic lecturing style. Okay. Um, uh, but it, it could have been very short, you know, it, it could have been a you know a few minutes like basically as long as they included a lecture it's included here and that's why i think this this slide is so interesting right because i do think that that many faculty use a lecture instructively in ways that help them to do the active learning techniques and help them to eventually connect to prior knowledge right so I think we need to not completely give up on lectures, but the problem that we have is when we have the, the traditional lecture where the only thing that's happening is that deductive stuff. So, yeah, lecture. And then the second thing I'll say, I wish Keith over here. Yep, I wish Keith over here. He I left out, a few minutes ago. So I took out my laptop when you were talking about what administrators can do and you were talking about collegial levers. So, we need more opportunities in CTRL and other departments for faculty fellowships because I sent the email to Dr. Thomas when we were talking saying, all right, this is the evidence that we need to support our faculty fellowship with AUX, the idea that this is collegial levers on institutional change for teaching improvement. So yeah, it's all related. Yeah. <laughs> like, this, is, this is the foundation that he needs to go and get more funding or doing this more intentionally and more systemically across campus. Yes, it, it, it's it's so it's so true, and I really feel like that lever is where it's at. And you know, in SOE, I feel like we've had some faculty meetings where we start the faculty meeting in small groups where we're talking about you know an, an issue that's around, let's say, our anti-racist pedagogy. You know, and I feel like that's 
that's the meat, you know, that's where, that's where it is, but it's not happening in, in all places and we need to do more of it and across the university. So, um, yeah, so two things, shout out to CTRL. One of the reasons why I remained standing was because some of the, some of the things that you had talked about, in fact, I was just in one yesterday where you talked about teaching and all that stuff and, and different, you know, all of these, you know, so shout out to CTRL. But the other thing that I was interested in, um, if we go, go back to that final slide that has what's at the bottom, and you don't have to okay. go back to it, but, um, one of, I'm a Cal State graduate, right? Um, for two microphones. But I, I guess, I don't know if you did ask this. You, one of the things that we found at many of the Cal States is that you have people who graduated from all ones, from the UCs, and in some cases, even from you know the IVs and said, I want to teach. I'm passionate about this knowledge. Yes, I can do research, but I want to teach students. And so they go to schools like Cal States, right? Or like the, the human system. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's where you, you touched on intrinsic motivation, right? Mm -hmm. And so I wonder um, the extent to which that was really, really captured. So they went to the onwards, they did whatever. They continue to do research, but they say, I, you know, I want to be able to teach people this. Mm -hmm. Do you know, I, so that I didn't study that as a part of the research, but when I was doing the observation, I had the opportunity to talk to so many faculty. Those faculty that you're describing couldn't wait to tell me their story, right? So they, you know, they had such an incredible narrative about why they ended up here. You know, I could have gone there or there, but I ended up here because they cared about teaching. Because on the job description, it talked about teaching. It centered mm -hmm. students. It centered a diversity of students. That's why I ended up there. Um, yeah, so thank you for lifting that up. And Lindsay, what time? Are we getting close to time? It's over. But oh, yeah. sorry. Everybody, <laughs> thank you so much. I really appreciate this, this time uh, and opportunity to talk to you about the book and this work. And I hope you um, think about buying the book. And, um, and con But most importantly, continue to engage with me in these conversations as we work together around the movement for college teaching improvement. So thank you all so much. Thank you.